Hello, folks, and thanks for joining me today. I've got a great guest. He runs a company that developed a couple of really slick software development tools, which is a passion of mine. I have with me Sai Saliv. His current company is called Quico, and it has two products that dramatically improve software development capabilities for his clients. Uh, there have been some massive financial successes in the space known as low code, although as you'll probably hear from Sai, he's hesitant to call the Quico tools low code. In addition to Quika, I want to get into his background because you'll see that he worked on an interesting combinations of startups and massive international companies and investment companies along the way. Sai, thanks so much for joining me today. Nice to be here. Great. So can you tell the folks what Quika is and what your two products are within the Quika suite? Uh, you know, I think... Uh, Software is a must for future success of every team in every business. And, uh, you know, Gartner reports this, my experience supports it. 75% of uh, enterprise software projects fail to meet expectations. And uh, as a result, there are many teams also inside large enterprises and small businesses. They do not have resources to develop software. So Quika is addressing this problem. Quika is Quika has two products, um, and uh, we speed up development of great UI and we speed up development of apps that meet the customer requirements. And that's with two different tool sets. Yes. Got it. So one is a designer for the for the slick front end, and one is for I've got a bunch of applications that I want to move to a more modern platform? Is that how you'd classify it? Or just, I want to just build net new applications? Yes. Uh, Quika Designer is for the enterprise IT. Uh, it enables them to capture business requirements and build a, U, a UI screen, a prototype as quickly as possible. The an, an analyst, a business analyst is the user of Quika Designer understanding the business requirements, using uh, component libraries, uh, component groups, they can quickly build UI. This way, the business owners can see what the screen looks like and can make immediate trade-offs versus writing 80 page, 100 page spec documents that nobody reads. Yeah, I think that's an important distinction. When when somebody can actually use a tool and make it look the way that they want it to, that's a much better way to communicate what needs to be built uh, than than writing a document or a use case or some sort of UML uh, notation. Yeah, John, uh, I mean, I mentioned this. Uh, many pro many software projects have uh, difficulty meeting the business requirements. What are the reasons for that? I think number one reason is it is very difficult to have a concise spec about what the software should be because there are so many business owners involved and it is very difficult for them to visualize exactly the trade-offs and what the product should look like. And uh, environments are changing, when people are changing uh, so fast, if the software product development doesn't catch up to it, you never have a successful ending. So it is like a catch-up game. Uh, requirements are changing too fast and development is not catching up to it. So speed is very, very key. Uh, so quicker designer, by using comp objects, component groups, and everything we can, speeds up the, develop, uh, the requirements gathering and building the UI. And then we hand off to development engineers, back-end development engineers, business logic, uh, a source code that, that would have been produced by front-end engineering. We deliver this automatically from the libraries uh, populated with the latest current properties to the back-end engineers so that they can uh, do all of the business logic development themselves. Enterprise wants the power to be able to make any complex changes to the software on the can. Uh, they spend a lot of time in the front end, so we are speeding up that process. That's great. Um, 
So I've heard you say that you don't like to use the term, you don't even use the term no code, which we've, we've heard in industry and you don't really even like the term low code. I guess, first of all, can you explain what most people mean when they use these terms? What are the differences between the two and, and why you might not love the terms for, for your products? Uh, I think uh, no code and low code uh, came because the idea is to have very powerful systems that uh, jet, that automate the mundane stuff, uh, the setup stuff, so that it, it, it gets built quickly. Uh, I think it's the right thinking. The reason I don't like no code is, I think uh, in business life, key to success is meeting expectations. Uh, when we are saying no code, uh, we are setting the expectations too low. And actually, Another key fundamental of business is focusing on the customer and creating value for the customer. The value for the customer is the customer wants a software product that solves business problem. And most importantly, he gets this fast. Time is of essence. Time is the most important competitive advantage. So the value is speed build the right product and build it fast. It doesn't matter if it is no code or low code. It is not relevant if it is fast. So uh, I don't, so that is I think the number one reason that I avoid using no code and low code. I am focused on the customer value, which is build a successful product, deliver a successful product that meets the needs and do it fast. You know, second part is uh, you know, as we talked about, the main problem in software development is not the software engineers. They are bright people, they, have, they are smart people, they are hardworking, dedicated people. Uh, most of these projects are uh, failing because it's difficult to get the requirements. So if we solve that problem, uh, the software engineers will produce code easily. Uh, I don't want uh, the goal to be low code uh, because the main goal is to build a successful product and do it fast. I am very happy if software engineers are involved so that uh, we are not limited by the constraint of a low code product. That, that's great. It, it, it's an interesting distinction. You're, you're, it, you are generating code with both of your tools uh, under the hood, uh, but you're not... Um, but, but what you're really doing is you're delivering better requirements rather than less code is what it sounds like to me. Um, and that, that's an interesting way of looking at these tools is they're, they're, they're more about driving requirements so that you can quickly uh, deliver software rather than uh, the amount of code. And I apologize, I've got someone at the door, so I'm gonna um, just mute real quickly and go grab this and see what they, what they need. I'll be right back. Sorry about that. I had someone coming by to install a new dishwasher. So. No, bro, I can see <laughs> the, the funds yeah. of working from home. Um, yeah, so, um, so so that's an interesting distinction that you make, and, and I think it's an important one. And I think that that probably goes into your messaging when you're selling the products, is this isn't about code. This is about building better software faster and making it look more like what you, the business analyst or business owner, think it should look like. Yeah, exactly. And I think, John, uh, you know, it took us a while. Uh, this company, we have been working on these products uh, close to four years, and we had different iterations, and we went sometimes to dance and came out. And, uh, but uh, we are focused on the customer and creating value. And from my business experience, uh, I know that speed and uh, innovation and delivering uh, software that meets customers' needs solves the problem is what customers are looking for. Absolutely, and, and you mentioned from, from your background in industry, and I mentioned that I find your, your background really fascinating. Can you talk, talk a little bit about your career and how it progressed over time and led to the point where you are developing software tools and, and, and selling them? Yeah, very quickly. I was born in Turkey, uh, and then after high school, uh, uh, I ranked number two in Turkey uh, among all of the thousands of students and I got a scholarship. I came to University of Michigan, studied computer engineering, industrial and operations organization engineering. And then uh, I got a scholarship to go to Harvard Business School and uh, do my MBA. 
Uh, then I, instead of joining large companies, I joined a startup company. Uh, and it was a software company in Boston area called Metagraphics. Uh, and we were uh, scanning engineering drawings and capturing uh, the image and creating 3D models uh, automatically. That was what we were focused on. And then uh, I started up a software company with uh, some colleagues and uh, it was very successful. We started two people and then it ended up uh, being one of the most successful software companies in Bar area. Uh, grew to 200 people. It was called NovaSoft. Uh, then um, I joined uh, Microsoft uh, as, uh, as the general manager of certain divisions. Uh, one of the most exciting jobs I had at Microsoft was to be responsible for Microsoft Office. Uh, I, I started the first group, uh, Business Productivity Solutions Group. Uh, I hired uh, 1,000 people in one year. Uh, at that time, Microsoft was much wow. smaller. Uh, <laughs> uh, and the goal was to get uh, business users around the world really understand uh, how to use office products uh, deeply and use them in their business processes. Use features like dynamic linking and you know, uh, pivot tables, all of these capabilities because there was a lot of competition coming with free Office-like products from other companies. So this was very successful. Today, I think uh, Office uh, generates the highest amount of cash for Microsoft. So the work we did in early 2000s uh, uh, is paying off uh, even now. Uh, and then I was uh, recruited to be the CEO of Turkcell, which is uh, one of the largest telecom companies in Eastern Europe. Uh, it is in. Uh, it has customers in eight countries, 72 million subscribers. That was a great job because I learned a lot about um, how the technology is changing and how the mobile revolution is coming. So uh, I think in Europe they call it the fourth industrial revolution, uh, digital transformation. I think mobile broadband, uh, fiber broadband, played a key role in this. And I was at the center of that. And, I, I uh, agree with I that. Was, and, yeah, I'd like to, uh, if I could, just inter interject there. So during this time, was Turkey moving from 2G to 3G networks, 3G to 4G? What was the dynamic that was going on? Because you, you were there for, what, about seven or eight years? Yeah, I was there more than uh, uh, close to nine years. Uh, uh, I started in end of 2006, and I left in 2015. Uh, when I went there, there was no 3G, there was no mobile broadband. It was just basically telecom around the world meant uh, hello, uh, voice and SMS. It was about voice and SMS. And uh, and, uh, and but I saw the change coming from Microsoft in the Microsoft campus. We had the fastest network and, you know, Wi-Fi everywhere. So I thought that uh, mobile broadband would do what Wi-Fi was doing to Microsoft campus and, and the power of that, power of reaching internet everywhere from, from the phones, from the computers in your pocket. Uh, so mobile services coming. So we did a lot of revolutionary stuff. Uh, we invested heavily into fiber so that we had a strong backbone. We brought 3G to Turkey. Uh, mobile broadband to Turkey. At that time, uh, there was a lot of resistance to this. I think other companies actually revolted against us. Uh, uh, they blocked the tender offer that gives this license. Uh, wow. But we made progress, and uh, I'm very happy to report that I was selected the, uh, one of the most successful CEOs uh, in Turkish business history. Wow, that's awesome. Congratulations. Yeah, I, I, I tell people it's, it's easy to forget about the importance of cellular networks to the development of applications, but they're really tied to one another. And I feel like you, you, you need the good handsets, you need the good network, before, and you need both of those before you can build the applications. And so the two really, or the three really co-evolve. I mean, you can't imagine building an Uber or an Airbnb on an old non-3G, non-4G non network. And I'm really excited to see 
what types of applications are developed as we start to roll out 5G globally and as the phones start to take advantage and then the application developers can start to take advantage. And it isn't just changing the applications that you build or how you build the applications, it changes what you're building. Um, I mean, the, the idea of being able to summon a car to come pick you up from somebody that you never knew is impossible without 4G and without a smartphone and without a GPS chip, right? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, technology pro makes uh, moves forward in almost all areas. So it is uh, coming together very nicely and enabling this and uh, amazing opportunities for us. You know, from this business experience, I really have two conclusions. One is as a business guy, uh, you know, I am happy to report that when I joined the company, its value was about six billion. And uh, during my time there, it went all the way to $26 billion. So wow. we created a lot of value. And this is a company listed in New York Stock Exchange. So I did probably uh, more than 35 uh, analyst calls every quarter. Uh, so uh, I have that business experience. And most important thing in business is focusing on the customer and delivering real value and being different superior to other alternatives the customer has. Mm -hmm. But in some, I call this delivering superior customer experience, A to Z. You know, if you look around, some of the most successful companies are the best in this. Like Apple delivers this incredible experience from A to Z, from its advertisement to customer experience in the stores, to products, to software, documentation, the product box, everything. The support, yep, the support after the fact. Support, the support, the support of the apps, you know, uh, software updates, everything. Uh, Amazon is another one, you know, uh, they would pay for those free returns because customer set was very important to Amazon. So I, this is very much true. So it is very important to look forward into the future and design a business model where you are delivering value, you are delighting the customer. So how do you do that? You do that by operational excellence, you do that by productivity improvements, and you do that most importantly by speed in innovation. Speed in innovation gives uh, value to the customer and gives the company differentiation versus competitors. So this is number one. Number two is, the technology change that we just talked about. Uh, there are three dynamics, I think. The first one, the b three major dynamics. The first one is computers are getting smaller and they are in our pockets, but they are also in sensors. They are in cars, refrigerators, in watches. They are everywhere. They are now putting a lot of sensors onto brows so that they measure. They are putting in patches so that they can measure sugar level, uh, glucose level in a human. They have now oxygen level from your watch. Uh, sensors everywhere. TVs have become computers, screens. And then there is AR, VR coming. So computers everywhere. And then cloud and connectivity everywhere through mobile broadband, fiber broadband. So in this world, uh, using this technology change, Companies are in a race, how to deliver higher value, get closer to customer. So now it becomes more possible to focus on the customer. You know, uh, I mean, this was, uh, this is very critical. Uh, with data science, now we are able to treat almost every customer on an individual base. Before these technologies, you could only treat them as like consumers and business customers. Now we can do much granular segmentation. So this is the new business world. And but in the center is software. In the center is optimization, data science, machine learning, AI. So software is key. And uh, the reason I uh, invested into Quika and the reason as a chairman and CEO, I am very, very excited about the future is I know from my business experience that there is software is a must. Mm -hmm. uh, software is a must for any team in the business world, large or small. Uh, as a result, 
I saw that software development uh, was a bottleneck. I think if we can speed up software, uh, large enterprises will benefit uh, it, if it is more productive. And also, uh, because large IT organizations are focused on these mission critical large applications, the departments, teams, they do not get these small apps that they need. So there is, uh, there is huge need for software. So if we can speed this up, I think it will, will help solve a lot of problems. Now, it, it, that's great. Thank you. And I, it strikes me that from our discussions and looking at your products that you're serving two kind of different buyers for, both for the designer and then the application studio tool. Can you maybe speak a little bit to what those two different buyer profiles look like and what problem you're solving for them? Because it is a slightly different problem, although I do think they're related. You are 100 percent right. You are 100 percent right. Uh, Quick designer is focused on, uh, again, because of my background, I thought it was very important to have a clear target customer so that we can deliver the highest value. So quick designer is targeting enterprise IT with large enterprise or uh, enterprise teams so that they have designers, front end engineers, Backend engineers, architects, product managers, they have a lot of role. And many of them have a lot of business logic people, but very few front-end engineers. Quicker designer helps capture the business requirement. The target user is a business analyst who understands the business requirement, who can talk to the business owners and consolidate that. And then using component libraries quickly on the canvas, put uh, screens together. I experienced this myself. It is really speeding up the development process significantly because the business owners see the screen and they can make live decisions. So instead of build taking weeks to develop screens, now you can do it in hours. It's a huge productivity increase. Uh, it eliminates a lot of wasted time of emails going, spec documents created, editions, revisions, and you know how. Who can deal with an 80 page, 100 page mm -hmm. spec tool? Well, there's another aspect of, of that tool, of the designer tool that really strikes me. One of the things big enterprises struggle with is standardizing on component libraries. And they might have five different people on five different teams who decide, I want to use Angular. I want to use this tool. I want to use that tool. I want to use Vue. And I think that a tool like your like designer standardizes on best of breed and you're making those decisions for them and it drives consistency across the organization. So I think that that's another piece where beyond the 80 page documents, I think a lot of big enterprises get tripped up on which component libraries to use because nobody just goes and writes raw HTML and JavaScript anymore or shouldn't be. <laughs> John, you did a better job of explaining that value that we create. Uh, you are hundred percent right. And, uh, you know, we already have quite a few large enterprises using designer and their CIO is telling me exactly that. We don't want every, in, in every app, every screen starting from scratch. We want these components because we want the discipline. We want all of the apps to have a, a similar look and feel, look, similar colors, all of that. Uh, you know, it is, it is what the customer wants, that, that standardization. Uh, maybe you uh, you're, you're, you're good. You can go ahead. Yeah, I'll, I'll unlock it for him. <laughs> okay. Hold on one second. All right. Sorry about that, Sai. We were no talking about the standardization no there. Yep. Yeah. So standardization is very important. Uh, that's what the customer wants. It's important for the brand of the company. Uh, it is important for the adoption of apps by the users because if the ad apps are similar look and feel, it's easier to use. But it also creates a lot of efficiency. Uh, and it makes it very easy later on to maintain the software. You can change these component properties and then it will replicate into the many apps that are using these components. So that is Great. number one. Yep. Uh, that's the quicker designer. And then uh, I, I, I forgot to add that quicker designer produces uh, the code, React.js code for this front end. So this, there is no need for uh, every 
uh, screen every component to be uh, programmed from scratch. Once we, we capture front-end engineers developed code in the library so that we deliver that populated with the current uh, properties and we hand that off to the back-end engineers. So that saves a lot of time. It also front-end engineering time uh, shrinks. Uh, Quicker Builder is focused for teams, not for large enterprise mission critical applications, but smaller teams which have limited resources. Uh, again, uh, we use, we are not insisting on a citizen programmer using this. We are saying a software developer use, will use this product uh, because we want to give the capability to develop any app. We don't want to constrain the power uh, capabilities we can develop. Uh, Quicker Builder not only has designer front end, but it binds with the database modeler and also manages all of the actions that are triggered by the UI. So it basically uh, does more of the, uh, it, it provides you pre-built functions uh, and it gives you capability to develop new functions through uh, SQL programming or C-sharp programming. Now you mentioned you've got the database modeler. If I have an existing database, maybe even an, an, an API that I've already built for something else and I want to incorporate it into my workflows, I, I'm assuming it supports that as well? Yes. I mean, this is why I am, uh, I am, not, uh, I am against no code. And this is why I am against uh, even using low code. I am about giving power to the user so that he can develop the right app quickly. So many businesses have a need to interface with existing databases, ex existing APIs. You know, it is too much to expect this from my uh, citizen uh, grandmother or something to develop this <laughs> application and this uh, connection. So, you know, as far as the custom is concerned, uh, if it is done right, and if it is done fast, he's happy. He doesn't really care if it is a sophisticated software engineer who built it or or a business analyst so Absolutely. i am very much i am very much about teaming up with it people people who know what they are doing technical people so that we can integrate to the right apis and build the right solution absolutely and and i can see where that's very useful especially when, when you think about there are teams that need applications to be built and it's too slow for them to go to IT because IT has this crazy standardized approach to building things that is optimized for building very, very mission critical systems. But I might be a marketing team that just wants to pull together some of my different data so that I can build some basic analytics and a couple of screens so that I can manage processes that might take and, and for folks who haven't worked in large IT departments, it can easily be six months to 12 months for a project that if, you know, if, if you've got the right tool, you could probably build fairly quickly. Yeah. You know, from my Microsoft experience and from a uh, Turkcell experience, right? In Turkcell, I had 19 companies report to me in different countries, in eight countries. Uh, you know, they had different IT organizations. You know, the CIO is mostly focused on the most important mission critical applications because if he fails in any one of them he's going to lose his job so mm -hmm. when he's doing those most important projects which are important for the company you know he doesn't he can't focus on these little apps in the departments but let's say let's say a sales team has a, a partner meeting coming and they want to create an app so that they can teach people about the new products offers coming and they want to test people and give feedback this that you know, we, even in, uh, in these big companies that I was working, uh, sometimes uh, we couldn't develop software fast enough uh, that as, we, as we needed. So uh, small businesses, large businesses, uh, teams, they need software. And uh, Quicker Builder is to give end-to-end -end, uh, app uh, quickly that meets the business requirements and it is developed fast. That's great. Thank you for the, the, the review of the two products and, and, and the, contrast, the contrast there. That's, that's really interesting. It, they're, they're related, but they're, they're very different audiences that, that you're going after there. Uh, do, you, do you find 
do you have any instances where you're seeing some cross sell between the two or is it, it mostly one, one person buys one or the other? Uh, you know, enterprise IT, uh, uh, enterprise IT is focused on the quicker designer, uh, but then they see the value and then they think, okay, uh, maybe quicker builder can be used in departmental teams with very little uh, support from us. So it, I think it's uh, then it is the second wave quicker builder comes to enterprise, but quicker builder. Uh, is a tool for small businesses and for any teams in large or uh, small organizations. Great. So I want to shift a little bit to the business side, less about the product side. Um, how do you measure your prog the progress of this business? Is it the number of users? Is it revenue? And what kind of time frame do you tend to think about when you're looking at the progress of Quica? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> You know, Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates, they all, uh, you know, these are people I have known for a long time and uh, uh, I have met them in many, many meetings and talked to them and everybody agrees that, you know, making, uh, creating large successful projects takes time and it's a team effort. So uh, we have a long-term horizon. Uh, uh, having the right vision is important. Having the right business perspective is important. I think what we are trying to do is the business side. We are trying to solve business problems by using technology. So my main focus is what I preach. Focus on the customer and make them successful. So we are about customer success. I want to team up with partners and create customer success. So, uh, but once you do that, uh, revenues, profitability, sustainable, profitable growth comes. So uh, we are very happy that although we are a young company, uh, uh, we have uh, successful enterprise customers uh, using designer and we are gaining a lot of momentum. Um, uh, some of this development is uh, done um, done, and but we are an international international company globally uh, uh, we are going to market this now uh, we are starting to introduce the product in the United States so we are going to partner with the right uh, teams to get this product in the hands of the people who need it that that's great and I love that answer it's it, the, the first order is take care of your customers make them better and then everything else falls into place when you look at customer satisfaction are you using uh, is, is it calling them and, and following up and getting a qualitative response? Do you do some surveys or how do, how do you guys think about that? How sophisticated is that? Because we see customers will do SurveyMonkey to try to predict CSAT, customer satisfaction scores or CSAT or net promoter scores. Do, do those matter at this stage or is it really just having a conversation with the user and seeing what, what their response is? Uh, we, are, we are not enterprise sales uh, mm -hmm. company. We are a subscription company and the customers, they don't even have to sign annual agreements if they don't want to. We give them a, a discount if they sign annual, but they don't have to. So uh, if, we, if our customers are not successful, they, stop they buying. don't. <laughs> so, as I know, the number of subscribers is increasing. This means that we have happy customers. So. Uh, uh, our business model is make the customer successful. Otherwise, we don't get paid. I like it. I like that a lot. That's great. I uh, spent some time with, with Red Hat, and that was a big selling point. If you don't like us, you're going to cancel us. So we, know, we have to earn your business every month, basically. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and, and, you know, we need to develop, keep developing our product, and customers' needs change. So it is, we are not trying to pull a fast one on any, anybody. And... Uh, you know, as long as we create value, uh, you know, we want to get a fair, fair price and we, we are not an uh, expensive company anyway. Expensive so, so you mentioned that you're going to market this internationally. Is most of your business in Turkey and nearby? And you, you mentioned plans to expand to the U.S. or, or is, there, is, is there a mix at this stage of the company of international versus Turkey? You know, this is my, this is my advice to everybody. I think... Uh, uh, it is a global world, and I think uh, you know United States uh, represents about 24% of the global economy. 
you know, obviously much smaller, uh, like 5% or 4% of the population, but huge part mm -hmm. of the economy. But 76% of the economy is outside. So uh, some of these markets, uh, they are less developed. There are opportunities. It comes with trade-offs. So we are a global company. Uh, we want to team up with people around the world uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, focus on the customer. Uh, so we have, uh, we have customers uh, in the United States. We have uh, obviously the largest market, most important market for us. So this is where we are going to be focused. Uh, we have uh, people in uh, San Francisco, in Seattle, and also in Boston starting to work on this, but uh, we want to expand to the rest of the United States with the right partners. That's awesome. And what do you think people get wrong when they're trying to sell in international markets? You know, every market has its own dynamics, uh, uh, but the essence of the business is the same. You need to make the customer happy and you need to create value and you need to offer superior value to different alternatives. Uh, I think, uh, you know, w one thing is uh, international markets. I, I mean, uh, I am keeping track of the global economic uh, metrics. Uh, although U.S. is 24% of the uh, global economy, in general, it is growing between 2 to 3%. But the international mm -hmm. markets, the rest of the uh, 76% is growing faster, actually, uh, more than 3%. And, and obviously, some countries like China and, uh, and, uh, and India are growing much faster. Uh, so uh, because of the internet, the equalizer, you know, the world uh, technology uh, is really uh, very similar across many countries. And uh, there are many... I could I could tell you that some in some of these developing countries like banking has gone uh, ahead of uh, what was available in the United States and you know US is now also doing well with the fintech companies but you know sometimes these large banks in the United States they were kind of slow in moving and slowing absolutely but we're just now getting real time payments in this country and that's something that europeans and asians or and even australians have much more experience with they adopted them much faster yeah so uh, i mean uh, as you know uh, uh, today we have some health pro health uh, pandemics around the world that is creating economic crisis so the whole world has a lot of big problems and businesses and technology we need to go and solve these problems and uh, so there is business needs across uh, the world. I think uh, for international markets, everybody respects companies coming from the United States. So uh, I think U.S. companies have that advantage. But uh, as you mentioned, you know you have to earn the customer's trust, and you need to keep winning the customer every day, every month. Uh, so it's an ongoing process. Uh, Customers want a solution and solution product is only a part of the solution. So the, the people side, uh, the service side, uh, the experience, the rest of the experience is very important. So, you know, we are not uh, selling just a product. We need to deliver solutions and partners are very important. So finding the right partners in the international markets is key. Just like in different parts of the United States, we need to find the right partners. Absolutely. So, Oops, sorry, go ahead. So it is, uh, you know, uh, in the Turk cell, I used to say, uh, our business is technology, but our real business is people. So, uh, you know, our team is made of people and our customers are people. So it's about people doing business with other people and, uh, and delivering value, creating value for uh, other people. So, uh, as much as we are in technology business, we are in people business, we should never forget that. No, I, I agree. That's, that's a real interesting perspective for sure. I'm curious, as we were talking, and um, again, you're an international company, but, but do have the, the background in Turkey. One of the things that, that intrigued me, we built a business in a prior life in Singapore, and it was interesting because Singapore really branded itself as a good place where East meets West. So if you want to do business in China or India, 
um, or, or, or other emerging markets, and but you're coming from a more mature market, or if you want to move in the other direction, Singapore is a good gateway. Do you think Turkey has some similar advantages because it's 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 part of Europe, it's part of NATO, but it, it also has some connections to a more, the, the emerging markets in the Middle East and, and Africa as well. Do you, do you see that dynamic playing out and is that something that Turkish companies capitalize on? So, uh, first of all, uh, uh, we do have some people uh, working in Turkey, but we have, we have also uh, people working for us in Netherlands, in Germany, in the United States. And, uh, you know, we have moved to remote, uh, remote working environment uh, in the last three, four years. And uh, so we have top talent uh, contributing to the development of our products and services. Um, I, uh, you know, I want to like in, in uh, Quika and also I have an investment in another company called System Optima. Uh, for these, both, both of these companies, we have world-class talent. I'll just give you one example. In one of these companies, uh, one of the key members of our technical advisory board is a gentleman, a professor uh, from uh, a professor uh, in, uh, in Ankara, Turkey. Uh, he is the inventor of the polar codes in 5G. So uh, he has a PhD from MIT. He's a graduate of Caltech. Uh, uh, he was my uh, you know, high school buddy. Uh, I am, uh, he's one of my best friends. So we have uh, another friend uh, who is contributing to this product, these companies is, is a PhD from MIT, uh, was a postdoc at Harvard, now teaching at University of San Diego, uh, California at San Diego. Uh, so uh, we have, I, I don't care where people are coming from, which country they are coming from, as long as- uh, They're the best people they, and they fit your system. Are they good people? Uh, <laughs> behavior is important. And uh, are they uh, smart people who are using science and technology to do good things for people and the planet? So we are about using science, technology, engineering, math to create value for people across the globe and to do good things for our uh, planet as well. Excellent. Excellent. So you, you mentioned the System Optima investment. Are there, do you actively invest in other companies or are you mostly focus on System Optima and Quicker? Uh, mostly I am focused on uh, uh, these two companies because focus is very important. And, uh, you know, when I left Turkcell to uh, go back to uh, entrepreneurship and investment, uh, you know, I just wanted to be a little bit more free in, in moving along and uh, faster and uh, to go back to the United States for family reasons. And, uh, uh, I, uh, I started up a comp investment company that invested in the next generation of successful technology companies. And obviously the last five years, uh, it turned out that I was 100% right. So these investments I made in the last five years, most of them were public companies, has done extremely well. So now uh, I am investing into, uh, into two businesses, uh, but you know, as I mentioned, this software, if we can solve, if, if we can speed up the software development process, it's a huge market, it's a huge contribution. So I am very excited about that. And also uh, optimization, doing, you know, state of the art, real time uh, optimization is very, very key in business, in almost uh, in every aspect of business. Imagine a company that has, uh, that sells to, uh, you know, hundreds of hundreds of uh, you, uh, sales points, and then they have five thousand salespeople, five thousand products. You know, large businesses are incredibly complex. Uh, you need real-time optimization to uh, maximize the customer satisfaction, uh, minimize the delivery times, minimize the cost uh, of operations improve the quality of the product, quality of the uh, output, uh, and also maximize profit, maximize sales. So real math, real optimization is required. So this is why we have top, uh, some of the top mathematicians in the world 
uh, uh, working in system optima to create uh, optimization solutions. So basically I decided after uh, my working for two large companies like Microsoft and Turkcell to focus on these two areas, software and optimization. So I think it's plenty for me. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it keeps me very busy. Uh, I'm <clears throat> very excited. I feel, I feel uh, like I just graduated and I have a, I have a startup <laughs> uh, mentality. I have a lot to do. I hope uh, my health cooperates. And, uh, <clears throat> but I also invested in a biotech company uh, that is in uh, New Jersey area. Uh, it is with scientists from Harvard uh, Medical School and also Princeton University. We are doing some amazing uh, research. Uh, I am helping that uh, group of scientists on the business side uh, uh, with my investment, but also uh, running the business going forward, uh, helping the CEO, supporting the CEO as a uh, as an investor. Yeah, it's a tough trade off because if you if you want to make a whole bunch of investments, you can't spend a lot of time with each one. But if you want to add strategic and if you want to add strategic value, you can't yeah. make a whole lot of investments because you only have so much time. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So I am, I mean, my style is not angel investment. My style is not venture capital. You know, I was a hands-on, uh, you know, I, in Turkcell Group, I was the group CEO. As I said, I had 19 companies reporting to me. So here I have only, uh, uh, you know, three companies. I am actively working uh, in supporting uh, the teams with my experience, network, uh, and the resources. So I think focus is very important. You are right. So I am... I'm, I'm not trying to spread myself to them. I'm trying to be focused. Now, have you raised any outside money in the Quica or into System Optima? Uh, in uh, Quica, we do have a partner uh, from the very beginning, a, a venture capitalist, but uh, he was also a software entrepreneur. So he had built a very successful software company and then sold his ERP software company for a large sum of money. And then uh, he and his son, they started a venture capital firm in San Francisco. Uh, so Vela Partners is our partner in uh, Quica. Uh, in uh, in uh, System Optima, it is the founding team, uh, myself and the employees, we own the company. Uh, we haven't uh, taken any uh, outside money. Uh, we actually didn't need to because uh, uh, the business is supporting itself. That's the best way to fund a business is revenue is the cheapest form of a uh, capital you can raise, right? <laughs> I, I think more important, the speed and going in the uh, right direction quickly. Uh, but, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the time, I, I hope the time comes, we partner with some uh, uh, bigger firms uh, because, you know, sometimes expansion uh, and they can, if they are value, add, they could also add value. There are a lot of smart people around the world. Uh, they could also you know, bring uh, financial resources, but also bring a lot of uh, intellectual value as well. Great. I've only got a couple more questions here because I know, I know you're a busy guy. What is the hardest part about building a product company in, in your mind? I think uh, starting up any business is difficult and especially during pandemic, but, uh, you know, uh, you know, you need to put the, uh, you need to put the right group of people. Sometimes the smartest people in the world, uh, they, become, they need to get, become more humble and they need to start collaborating with the customers. Instead of uh, inventing a solution in a closed room, I think it is very important to collaborate with other people and also collaborate with the customers. You know, my, my, uh, you know after all of these years, one of the key advice I give to startup people is, uh, go and find uh, a rich company or a rich, cus rich person who has a big problem to solve, you know, then, uh, then you have a business. <laughs> that's, that's great advice uh, with a big, I'm writing this down to put in the show notes. Well, that, that's great. Um, I'd like to end on a question here that I'd like to ask people. Um, what is the number one book that you find yourself recommending or giving as a gift to people around around business or entrepreneurship? Do you have one that sticks out? Uh, you know, I, I read a lot. And uh, I, from my uh, early years, uh, from my high school years, I was very interested in reading about successful people uh, because I am interested in their story, where they started and how they uh, solved the challenges they faced. 
So that inspired me to be a business guy versus a scientist or a professor. Um, uh, but the book, uh, one specific book uh, I mostly uh, enjoyed and recommend a lot is called Boys in the Boat. I don't Boys in the Boat. Boys in the Boat. It is the story of a, uh, it's a true story. Uh, uh, it's the true story of a, of a group of people who were uh, the crew, rowing crew uh, uh, for University of Washington. Uh, and they started from very humble background. Actually, the uh, hero of the book uh, was left by his family at the age of 15 uh, because he was growing up and he was eating too much food and his siblings were not getting enough food. So his stepmother and his father, they left him uh, in a wow. remote location. Uh, he started from there. He went to University of Washington, uh, made the freshman a crew team, and then uh, they won the national championship, and then they went to 1936 Berlin Olympics and won the gold medal. Uh, the book talks about overcoming challenges, and its most important message for me was in a, in a, in a crew team of eight people rowing, they were rowing sometimes close to 48, 49, 50 strokes a minute. So they need to be in incredible sync. So it teaches about trusting your teammates. You cannot win a race by yourself. You need to be part of the team and the boat needs to go faster. One person, if you push too hard, you could even hurt the team. So uh, it teaches about struggles, uh, you know, it ends, uh, but it is mostly about trusting your teammates and being a great teammate. So I think, uh, I think, uh, you know, we love basketball, we love football, we are watching NBA, we are watching football and baseball, uh, soccer, but the ultimate team sport is business. Uh, and I think uh, that guy who rode in the team later on, he joined Boeing as an engineer, and Seattle, after the depression, was a very low-income neighborhood. Today, Seattle is hosting uh, number one and number two richest guy and the number two of the <laughs> top three highest market cap companies in the world. So if you trust your teammates, if you build a strong team, you can build incredible success. Yeah, when you don't even talk about Starbucks when you're talking about a city, you know that the city's made it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's Starbucks, Costco, T-Mobile, Expedia, Boeing, uh, yeah. <laughs> Amazon, and Microsoft. There are a lot of successful companies. But I think, uh, you know, there are similar stories everywhere around. I think there are challenges in the world, but we should not be too discouraged. I think uh, there are a lot of problems that we can solve. Absolutely. Well, th this has been great. And I will put a link to that book in the, in, in the show notes for this podcast when we publish it. Sai, this has been awesome. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you very much, John. It's a pleasure. All right. Have a good day. Bye-bye.